Thank you so much, Momita. Good evening, everybody, the senior faculty and the students who have joined this ICA webinar. Welcome. And it's a proud privilege that we are hosting these webinars, which are very, very popular. And I must inform you that today is the 195th webinar, which we are hosting. So in the next five weeks, we will be having our second century. We've been doing these consecutively and they are very, very popular and we are very proud of them. And for these, of course, we have very experienced faculty who join us. Before we start with today's webinar, I would like to inform all of you of the 5th International and 15th National Conference, National Conference of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists, which is going to be held in the King's College, King George's Medical University in Lucknow on, from the 12th to the 15th September this year. So the theme is outcome enhancement in anesthesia. But what I want to tell the students and other young delegates are, is that we have a very good workshop program. 12th is, of course, for the paramedicals, but 13th is the workshop, which is going to be very, very fruitful. There are plenty of workshops in this. The details will be out on the website very soon, and they are there. So please do register as soon as possible and reserve your tickets for luck now. In addition, I want to tell you that we have a yearbook of anesthesia, which we release every year during the national conference. And then this can be bought from the website www.pustak.com. So here also you can get the advantage. You have very, very good uh, articles and presentations which you must read and they are a big benefit for the students. So coming today, today for the PGs as such, we have very good PG uh, sessions and today we have the I PG assembly, which we call with a case discussion on the transurethral resection of prostate and the pediatric anesthesiology. For this, we have two very seasoned examiners. One, of course, you all know very well, Dr. Mujusuri Upadhyay, who was the HOD earlier in PMC Mangalore, and he continues to be the professor there. The second examiner is our young Dr. Chandani Sinha. She is a professor in the in uh, All India Institute of Patna. And she, of course, is the professor and has got several achievements, more than 100 publications and many awards of the best paper in the EORA as well as the uh, European Congress of Regional Anesthesia. So we have very experienced examiners who are going to examine the students. So welcome you all and thank you, Dr. Madhusudan and Chandani. Please take over. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, madam. Uh... Yeah, uh, the first case uh, we are going to discuss is uh, about the transurethral resection of the prostate. And uh, next we'll talk about uh, hydrocephalus. I will uh, try to uh, take you through uh, the first session. Does, that doesn't uh, necessarily mean that uh, uh, Chani can be quiet. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Sood said, Madam Sood said, uh, I have been... Uh, uh, on this panel quite often. I think if there is an award for uh, the maximum appearances in the ICA webinars, I think I deserve to get it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think I will get a Padma Shri also. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a proud privilege to be uh, uh, on the panel uh, uh, anytime, especially in front of uh, uh, Dr. BRK, Dr. Jayashri, Madam, Baljit Singh. I, I, I feel very privileged to be here. Uh, can we have uh, the case uh, on uh, uh, slide of uh, yes, yeah. yeah now uh, to just to tell you that uh, chani uh, was uh, just for our... confirmation is my screen visible to you sir yeah yeah sure okay. yes uh, chani has been uh, on, uh, she was a student who passed from kmc mangala and one of our uh, brightest stars. Obviously, she joined uh, uh, Ames Delhi on the trauma side, and then she shifted to uh, somewhere near her hometown. And uh, she's a prof of anesthesia in Ames Patna right now. 
uh, it's really another pro privilege for me to be sharing this with uh, one of my ex students. Uh, thanks, Chani, for having uh, accepted this. Oh, yeah, uh, this, yeah. So, can I just say a few words? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Firstly, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity because, you know, it is always an honor to be part of the program in which your teacher uh, teaches there. I mean, to share the same diets, to uh, share the same place. You have always been an inspiration and motivation to many of us. And thank you, sir, again for calling me and giving me this opportunity. Yes. Uh, shall we get started? Yeah, both uh, both of you, the presenters, uh, these are uh, short cases when it comes to your exams, whether it's it's national board or uh, master's programs. And short cases basically uh, not necessarily means that you have to uh, be brief when you uh, take the case, when you examine the patient, but you write down only the uh, pertinent uh, points, the positive points. And uh, when you present also, invariably the examiner would ask you to present only the positive findings and uh, especially with the uh, uh, viewpoint of uh, the outcomes uh, anesthesia based or surgical based outcomes therefore uh, be brief when you present uh, the case and then we will uh, take it forward sure. are you there sir yeah uh, we, a very good evening sir respected good evening. yep sir share chat so, uh, my patient is a 70 year old male patient from Ayodhya. He is a farmer. He has a chief complaints of increased frequency of maturation since two years, difficulty in initiating maturation since two years, and weak urinary stream since two years. So, his uh, uh, history of pressure illness. Patient was append normal two years back when he noticed increased frequency of maturation, and the increment was insidious in onset and gradually progressed up to 10 to 12 times a day without increasing a water intake. And he also complains of weak urinary stream, which exaggerated on straining and a sense of incomplete bladder voiding post maturation. He also, uh, there is no history of pain while urinating or blood in urine, no significant weight loss or loss of appetite, no history of fever, abdominal what pain, are or the vomiting. symptoms collectively called known as? Uh, these symptoms are uh, voiding symptoms and these are uh, uh, storage symptoms, sir. In voiding symptoms, these are uh, you know, poor stream, intermittency, sense of incomplete voiding, and sterning. And for uh, storage symptoms, uh, this includes sir, uh, frequency, increase in frequency, and uh, urgency, and nocturia. So. Yep. Carry. And uh, the fastest of patients, the patient is a known case of hypertension for four years and he is on regular medication. He has no history of angina, syncopal attack or peripheral arterial disease. Only the positive findings. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, in the personal history, the patient is uh, having sleep disturbance due to the midnight awakening of okay. past urine. So he also takes decreased uh, water intake in the evening time. Do you call this nocturia or? Ah, uh, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. They are collectively called as LUTS, right? Lower uh, LUTS, lower symptoms. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. Sleep is on. disturbed. Yeah. Sleep yeah. is disturbed, sir. Yes. Sir, right. Next. Uh, on the general examination, uh, patient is uh, conscious or into time, place, and person, sir. Fine. And uh, no, uh, or, and their general examination is within normal intervals, sir. And the systemic examination also within normal limbs. So, in the airway, patient was uh, edentulous, and rest of the airway was normal too. What is that? MPG two. The malignant grade was two, sir. The patient. Uh, it's very rare to have uh, one of the Indian uh, Indian born scientists whose name is frequently remembered by anesthesiologists. And if you cut that short, it uh, pains. Basically, what is uh, MPG? Who is Malapati. MPG? Who is Malapati. MPG? Yeah, what's his name? Full name. Malapati, sir. What's his yeah. full name? Full name, sir. I don't know. Have you read his paper? Malampati S. Rav is the name. He's from uh, Andhra Pradesh, right? But though he settled in US. Have you read his paper? No, How sir. many grades did he describe when he so talked four, about? Four grades, sir. Four? Malampati S. Rav? Yes, sir. Malampati, yes, sir. 
Are you sure? We'll yes, wait sir. till the end. If uh, something dawns on you, we'll uh, discuss that again. Yeah. Yes. Malapati, great. Yes, then. Anything else positive? As uh, an elderly man who presents to you with uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, Lutz, uh, elderly man, right? What are the what are the things you would like to look into? So, uh, if an elderly person uh, appears that there is a normal physiological change, age related changes in the whole system. So. Yeah, that's fine. But uh, what could be the com comorbidities? You said he's a hypertensive since four years. Yes, sir. On, yeah. Anything else an elderly so, gentleman can have? Ah, so elderly. Also, they, this patient can have uh, diabetes, sir. This mm -hmm. patient comorbidities. Also, mm -hmm. they have some cardiovascular problems, sir. Yeah. Ischemic heart disease. Uh, mm -hmm. He is also can be can COPD. He's is uh, probably having smoking, sir. So COPD, uh, asthma, and these all symptoms also present in the elderly face, sir. Yeah, basically all the systems can get deranged, right? Yes, he can have uh, all the comorbidities. When yes, you sir. take the history, it is worth uh, uh, ruling out all these comorbidities, though yes, you need sir. not mention them. Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, he, yeah. You are saying something. Ah, so the, the age related physiology changes in elderly, sir? No. No. Did I ask you? In the exams, uh, you don't volunteer to answer something which is not asked, right? You yes, just sir. stick to what you have been asked. And uh, it can be that you put your foot into quicksand if you uh, uh, try to uh, be a little over-enthusiastic and try to come up with uh, something, right? I didn't ask you about the physiological changes, sir. right? If sir. it is needed, I will ask. When I ask, you can answer, right? Yes. Don't volunteer any new things it may it may uh, uh, lead to uh, the examiner believing that you are a little being uh, you being a little arrogant and it may not augur well for your uh, uh, further performance let's not yes, sir, right. do that okay yeah this yes, guy is a uh, hypertensive for yes, four sir. years and uh, yes, uh, according to you the blood pressures have been uh, normal and the heart rate is uh, what is amlodipine by the way it's a calcium channel blocker sir any other I calcium have... channel blockers you know of? Yes, sir. Uh, amlodipine, sir, are, it's a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. Yeah. Uh, along with, uh, sir, uh, verapamil is also a calcium channel blocker. TTSM is also a calcium mm. channel blocker. Mm. Nifidipine is also a calcium channel mm. blocker. Mm. These are calcium channel blockers. Sir. Only. Anything else? The newer yes. ones. Newer ones. Uh, so, so, so. Okay. Uh, when you have uh, uh, hypertension, whether it is case discussion or not, it's always better to be prepared with uh, the antihypertensives too, right? The classification and uh, how they interact with your anesthetic, how it influences your anesthesia, right? Yeah. Okay. This patient uh, has only hypertension. It's your good luck. And uh, how do you investigate this man when he's he has lower urinary tract symptoms. He has been having nocturia frequency. And obviously, it is pointing towards an enlarged prostate. It might be benign or otherwise. How will you investigate this guy? Uh, uh, if the patient comes with a low, lower urinary tract infection, uh, we can investigate with uh, uh, using uh, check the PSA of the patient, prostate specific antigen. And also we can... Uh, right away, the PSA. You're not a urologist. Hmm. To jump you, into PSA first. Uh, sir, we also look for whether the patient... Uh, clinically also, we will look for the patient. Yeah, you are an anesthesiologist. You have to look at uh, the anesthesia aspects of it. Uh, sir. The beauty of anesthesia as a specialty is you don't have to bother much about the diagnosis, right? The diagnosis is given to you. The comorbidities also are given to you. You yes, are not going to detect something new. You may, but uh, it's not your primary responsibility, right? Yeah, diagnosis is their headache. That we will see later. As an anesthesiologist, what will you do? Uh, in, the, in, in this patient, uh, sir, uh, I will look for the uh, investigations, sir. Uh, mm. Hemoglobin. 
this patient shall what, be the elderly patient what are the investigations you need to know uh, it's complete blood count i need complete blood count uh, i need the kft of the patient i need total uh, i what need uh, what is that LF, sir. what did he say uh, cbc of the patient KFT. Kidney function test. Uh, oh, I need the kidney okay. function test. Sir. I'm I'm used to the RFT, renal function test. And uh, for heaven's sake, uh, try to avoid uh, abbreviations. I just told you MPG is not okay. Yeah, that's why I cut down on all the uh, abbreviations. You have to expand them. Yeah, not TLC, total leukocyte count. Uh, not totally. HP, hemoglobin. Yes. Yeah, hemoglobin is needed. Yes, sir. These patients right. are elderly patients, sir. So they are prone mm -hmm. for anemia. Also, in uh, transducial resection of prostate, so there is more chance of bleeding. So we have to aware of the pre op hemoglobin of the patient. Okay. Um, and uh, we also check for the uh, uh, total count of the patients, the total leukocyte count of the patient, also, sir. Mm -hmm. Because this patient, uh, because of the uh, obstructive, obstructive uropathy, was prone to uh, have infections, also, sir. Okay. So in this case, we all check for total cost counts. Also, we also look for platelet count of the patient. So. That's the only reason why you should uh, have the total leukocyte count or uh, do you need the WBC count for something else? Yeah, Sir, they are I'm... prone to have infections, I agree. But do you need it? You yes, only said uh... the patient will be posted for uh, uh, TUR of prostate and something else can happen. You should always... Keep the surgery in mind and the complications in mind, right? Whenever you investigate. Yeah, hemoglobin, you said the patient can bleed. Right, done. Then, TLC for what? So, uh, if if there is an obstructive uropathy during, during the times of bleeding, there can be a septicemia, sir. So patient during can go bleeding. into septic shock. During bleeding. Okay, fine. The patient can have bacteremia and sepsis. I agree, sir. but not uh, due to bleeding. It is because of the sir, instrumentation. Post. Yes, sir. It's basically because of the instrumentation and it is because of the fluid which is pushed into the urinary tract with yes. pressure, with a lot of force, right? That yes. can drive the bacteria which are normal inhabitants of uh, lower urinary tract. They can be displaced into the system and the patient can have bacteremia and sepsis. Yeah. Yeah, you need the TLC as a baseline also. Okay, then. What else do you need? Sir, platelet count of the patient should be checked, sir. For what, sir? Uh, sir, uh, it is because of the patient can have coagulopathy and I prefer this uh, type of patient to take on uh, regional anesthesia. And there is, due to this uh, uh, irrigation fluid, there will be dilution thrombocytopenia of the patient also. Sir. Hmm. And, Dilutional uh, thrombocytopenia is uh, too far-fetched uh, and uh, you are going to do uh, under spinal and you would like to have a platelet count. I think uh, if uh, I were to be your examiner, I would have said come after six months. No way. The, the investigations, uh, you read the pre-op evaluation chapter from the Miller or you read the NICE guidelines and you stick to them. Over-investigating the patients is never done. Okay. That's why... Uh, platelet counts are not needed as a routine investigation. Your spinal needle, just because it goes through into the subarachnoid space, it doesn't mean that you have to get the entire coagulation profile. If your patient has something which is indicative, I agree. You have to investigate. Otherwise, you don't. Okay, then. Uh, then the, uh, I should also record serum electrolytes of this patient. So yeah. I need uh, sodium, uh, serum sodium, serum potassium also. So. Mm -hmm. This uh, elderly male uh, also prone for the hyponatremia. Also, during the irrigation fluid, there's also dilution hyponatremia of these patients also. So. Yeah. According to you, this patient, other than hypertension, has nothing else. Therefore, uh, hyponatremia, chronic hyponatremia is uh, too far-fetched. Yeah. The next half is acceptable. Yes. The patient will have dilutional uh, hyponatremia because of the irrigating fluid getting absorbed. Fine. I... Uh, accept that. Then, what else? Then I need an ECG of this patient, sir. Electrocardiogram of this patient, sir. Yeah, I understand. ECG, electrocardiogram, yes. Why? Uh, 
because these uh, patients can have uh, age related changes in ecg or also my patient is a hypertensive patient uh, he have compensatory left ventricular hypertrophy and that changes in ecg can be also seen so it's a little difficult to accept again because um, uh, miller uh, won't accept the age is only a number when it comes to what miller says and also the nice guidelines don't uh, what kind of uh, uh, surgery is this is it uh, how do you categorize uh, trp is minor it a, minor surgery trp yes, mm -hmm. yes, hmm. then minor surgery should be done as a day case and uh, get the patient in the morning and uh, send the patient home back in the evening one is uh, extremes of ages he is uh, 70 years therefore uh, he is an elderly gentleman you cannot be discharging him the same day and the hemodynamic changes uh, uh, the volume changes obviously because of uh, the because of uh, no uh, because of the uh, transurethral resection obviously it's not uh, uh, conducive for the same day uh, discharge of the patient it you cannot all right it surely is not a minor surgery there are when you list out uh, so many complications how can it be a minor surgery or kill no it is not all right yeah yes sir yeah ecg yes i accept that because it's a major surgery and uh, but age is only a number you can't say that he's 70 years and you would like to hypertension for four years maybe he qualifies to have an ecg okay ecg done it's a normal ecg then then uh, sir i also uh, like to have a chest x of this patient so can you have your uh, face on the screen yeah chest x of the patient also sir for what sir uh, sir uh, this patient can have uh, any uh, no i am not ragging you i am not ragging you i said that earlier only when it is indicated in the history and the examination then you investigate otherwise uh, you don't need those investigations okay yeah just x ray is not needed then yeah if you want a uh, psa fine you can your urologist will uh, get it done and if he has any doubt uh, uh, when he does a pr examination obviously he would have uh, uh, felt the consistency of the uh, prostate and then you would have gone ahead with the prostate biopsy also right yeah if there is nothing indicative then you need not do all these investigations all right yes. yeah what else? Something which I expected you to say in the beginning. Then, Along with the blood test, something else. Do you want the blood grouping done? Ask blood grouping done, sir. Yes. Yeah. Blood grouping. You may not arrange for blood, but you have to get the blood grouping done because you only said that bleeding is one of the commoner complications of uh, the surgery all right yeah do you know anything about the international prostate uh, symptom score ipss or do you know the bother score don't bother you don't have to know about all that if you know it it's an add-on you will get some uh, uh, you will score some brownie points otherwise you need not okay yeah that's all up to the urologist to uh, prepare the patient We'll presume that the patient has a benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia, as you claimed. We've got another 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, your investigations have been uh, quite okay. Then how will you uh, prepare the patient and uh, how will you anesthetize the patient? What is the choice of anesthesia? For taking the surgery, sir, I will... Uh, He's a hypertensive it. on four, yes, for four years on amlodipine. Would you continue the antihypertensives or you won't? Uh, uh, I will continue the antihypertensives, sir. Okay. And and uh, actually before uh, taking to surgery, sir, I give certain instructions to the patients. Mm -hmm. I will uh, ask about the NPO status of the patient. 
and uh, i will get a written uh, consent by explain the uh, mode of anesthesia i am doing uh, the complication complication that can occur and uh, the brief uh, surgical approach also sir and uh, my mode of anesthesia is surgical uh, surgical approach i don't think you need to explain it's the surgeon's responsibility it is listed out in their consent form therefore you need not talk about the surgical approach uh, if at all you are asked about that you should always be in a position to tell them that it is up to uh, you you may please ask the surgeon about what exactly is he going to do you can only uh, believe that it's going to be a transurethral resection of prostate and uh, what could be the complications related to my anesthetic and uh, maybe uh, surgical complication which I may have to handle on table, right? Yeah. Then? Uh, uh, then I proceed. Uh, written informed before... consent. What are the complications you are going to tell the patient about? So I will uh, tell about the possibility of uh, Tauch syndrome, sir. Mm. And I will also tell the possibility of uh, profuse bleeding. Mm. And uh, also there is a chance of uh, bladder rupture during the procedure. Mm -hmm. And also there is a coagulopathy also occurs. Sir. Okay. Then? Uh, then even the, uh, they can also happen post-operatively. There's a chance of septicemia also in the post-operative. Mm -hmm. Tub syndrome is even uh, post operative tub syndrome can occur. Okay. And then. there is clot retention can be occur and patient can be rescheduled to OT also, sir. Again, that's all their headache. You need not uh, talk about that. Okay. okay. Uh, again, putting your feet into quicksand, it's uh, not worth it. Something else, anesthesia related, you are not going to say anything to the patient. It's only procedure related. You are uh, smart. Anesthesia related, there cannot be any complications. Yes, sir. Uh, there is. Uh, what are the complications you are going to talk to the patient about when you talk about written informed consent? For uh, just stick to anesthesia. What are the anesthesia complications you are going to talk about? Uh, patient what, are the, may, what are the rule? Patient may have bleeding and uh, there is a probability of shifting the mode of anesthesia. To general anesthesia also, sir. If I choose the regional anesthesia, there is have to change to uh, if there uh, de decrease in mentation of the patient due to the complications. Okay. And uh, if there is a cardiovascular or uh, problems due to uh, or fluid or load. Then again, uh, you are talking about the surgical uh, complications. You are not talking about anesthesia per se right now. Chani, you can uh, interlude in the middle. The monotony can be broken. It's not monotonous, sir. Uh, please go ahead. I'll ask. I'll ask. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, due to the uh, regional anesthesia, there can be hypotension and. Uh... Yeah. The basic rule or dictum is that uh, any complication which is more than 1% possible, possibility is more than 1%, you should be talking to the patient about those complications. When it is minuscule, like uh, most of our patients, when they look at uh, the, we have printed formats, right? Towards mm -hmm. the end, it is actually the death. Death is the last complication they all write about or printed. And there are educated people who ask us, is it a possibility? It is a possibility, but it is not that frequent that uh, we talk about that to you at that time, right? You tell the patient, you need not worry much about the death. You you have to tell them that it's only the complications which are more than 1% we are going to talk to you about. Therefore, you generally we will have a safer outcome. This fellow does not have much of a uh, com uh, comorbidities. Should not be a huge problem. Okay, You talk about every possible complication, the patient will run off. You will lose a patient. Then you will have to do a lot of uh, answering to the management. Yeah. Then written informed consent taken, antihepatins yes. used to be continued yes. and you have to talk to the patient about the fasting. How long does he fast? Uh, the patient should fast uh, 8 hours for solid and uh, two, hours, 2 hours for the clear liquid, sir. And? and 6 hours for semi-solid liquid, sir. And uh, then 
this is uh, akhil nair's uh, guidelines Sir, uh, patients will fast for eight hours for solids, sir. Eight hours is that's what I am questioning again. Eight hours. Yeah, if he wants to have mutton biryani, maybe yes. Fat, food, heavily laden with fat. Maybe you have to give them a little longer time. Other otherwise, it is six, six four, hours. and two, right? Six yes. hours and two. Now uh, he's an elderly gentleman. Give him some food till six hours and. Uh, Till two hours uh, prior, you can give uh, clear fluids, right? Yes, that should be good enough. What do you mean by clear fluids? Yeah. So free water mm. and um, dextrose contained water. Free water, so mostly. Free water, you said. Mm. Free water. Okay. If I buy uh, uh, bottled water, that doesn't become clear fluids. Just pulling your legs. Yeah, it is not free water. It is water, yeah. just water, simple. Now, basic dictum is, again, uh, whatever where you can read, you have the clear fluid in a glass and the, the paper put behind, placed behind, you should be able to read the letters. That is the definition of clear fluids, right? Pulpless and clear fluids, yeah. Just ragging, yeah, continue. What's your choice of anesthesia? Uh, so my choice of anesthesia is uh, regional anesthesia. Yeah. Probably subarachnoid blocks. Sir. Okay. And... Why subarachnoid block? Sir, uh, in this elderly patient, it have uh, certain advantages. Sir. Like mm. uh, if the patient uh, take another regional anesthesia, mm. we can look for the uh, mentation of patient on yeah. uh, intraoperatively. Mm. And uh, it will uh, decrease the bleeding. So, and it's, it, 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 it works, uh, Which one? The mentation, will, mentation will reduce the bleeding. What did you say? No, sir. The, uh, hmm. You said elderly man, you would like to look at the mentation. Are you a psychologist yes, by any chance? No, sir. Yeah, it's easier to know the complications. Yep. Yeah. The it's QR syndrome, the obviously the CNS symptoms. Be, be very clear when you answer them. Basically, again, as I said, uh, don't allow the examiner to ask you multiple questions for the same over the same point. When he asks a question, then you should uh, give points uh, one after the other. You should not give any opportunity for the examiner to open up. Okay, that will be a sign of a very good uh, student who is well prepared for the exams. All right? Yeah. Don't be scared. Don't be scared of the examiner. He's also a human being. All right? Even if I don't sound like one. So basically, uh, I look, uh, I look for uh, because of uh, yeah, regional in... anesthesia is uh, perfect. I agree. Subarachnoid block is good enough for uh, a TORP, transurethral resection of prostate. Yeah, justify uh, your answers. Yes, sir. Because basically, it's, I prefer subarachnoid block because it is had improved analysis, yes, sir, and okay. it uh, they, it decreases the circulatory overload and okay. it uh, allows to the look for the mental stress of patient in between the operation. And Correct. it also helps the patient post op to decrease the thromboembolic phenomenon. And mm -hmm. it also helps to decrease uh, bleeding. So, bleeding chances of bleeding compared to general anesthesia. Because. Okay. I agree. The mean blood pressure comes down. Therefore, the chances of the chances. Uh, bleeding uh, uh, will come down. But I will argue out saying that uh, there is uh, splanchnic vasodilation and therefore uh, blood, blood col will collect around the gut and the pelvis. But anyway, the mean pressures come down because of your subarachnoid block and the bleeding is lesser than elderly gentleman, you said. What else? Then you have to, when you justify your answer for a regional anesthesia, you should also talk about what could go wrong with the general anesthesia, right? Yes. Yep. What could be the problems with general anesthesia? Yeah, one yeah. is uh, it's difficult to know when the TR syndrome develops. It's quite difficult. We'll discuss that a little later. And then elderly gentlemen and general anesthesia. Uh, sir, there's also a chance of aspiration if this have uh, taken on the general anesthesia. Okay, that's a little too far-fetched. Something else. Mm -hmm. You are given GA and the next morning. 
the patient may not be absolutely normal what can you what's what do you decipher uh, uh, post operative cognitive dysfunction and cognitive dysfunction also of yeah, course exactly em emergency from the anesthesia is also a problem yeah you can avoid all that right yeah yeah spinal anesthetic how much will you give sir uh, i will give uh, uh, 2.5 to 3 ml, uh, 0.5% heavy book back okay? uh, Because mm -hmm. these patients are uh, have less spinal canal space and they're more sensitive uh, to these drugs. So. Okay, and, if, a, uh, if, a, if a young guy comes for, uh, say, a 50-year-old guy has uh, an enlarged prostate and uh, he comes for TRP, how much will he give? What would be our volume of local anesthetic into the subarachnoid space? All of 4 ml. Uh, it will determine the uh, duration of surgery and... Uh, yeah, uh, TURP should not go longer than... Uh, six one hours. Months. Yeah. Then. So, I will use only 3 ml of uh, 0.5 uh, but, uh, percent book. This old man, also poor man, you are using uh, 3 ml. Uh, little less than 3 ml, so 2.5. 2.95. Yeah, generally you don't need the 3 ml as you said the subarachnoid space contracts and uh, the csf volume comes down therefore obviously when you use 3 ml you may have a block which is much higher than needed what is the level of anesthesia you need for a turp so i need uh, at the level of t10 i need level of t10 for the uh, spinal anesthesia yeah then t10 even in uh, me if you give 3 ml, you will have T6 or sometimes T4 level, right? Yes, sir. Generally, averagely built uh, Indian male, you will have a block up to T6 or T4 with 3 ml of uh, local anesthetic. What is the average height of an Indian man? Uh, almost 5.5 to point. Yeah, 5.5 to 5.6. 5. Okay, then? Yeah. That's why you don't need that much of a volume, okay? Yeah, you can always reduce. 2.5 to 2.6 ml should be uh, more than enough. But uh, if you give a little bit of anti-trend lumbar, maybe you can give a little more volume and you can have dense uh, local anesthetic block at the lower levels, okay? Yeah, generally you need up to T10, block up to T10. Why? Uh, uh, because there is over distension of bladder due to the irrigation fluid yeah. and the sympathetic fibers from this uh, over distension bladder taken from T11, T12, L1 and L2. So, okay. so we have Good. to block till T10 for this. Good. Adequate the other condition. reason why you should not go up is you can't should not have a block up to uh, say T6 or T4. Why? Sir, uh, if there is any complication occurs, there is Good. a yeah, your uh, bladder perforation then do you, yeah. do you delay in recognizing the uh, when there is a perforation when there is a perforation where does the fluid go the, if the perforation occur the dome of the uh, bladder it can go to intraperitoneal okay uh, if this the neck of the urethra is uh, ruptured then it anywhere goes to else basically yeah extra peritoneal if it is extra peritoneal what does the patient complain of uh, sir, if the extra peritoneal pain, then patient complains of suprapubic pain or the okay. region. Sir. Yeah, in the lower half of the abdomen, basically, including suprapubic. Yeah, if it is intraperitoneal uh, uh, spread of uh, fluid, then uh, patient also complains of uh, shoulder pain due to diaphragmatic irritation. Diaphragmatic sir. irritation and diffuse abdominal pain, right? Abdominal distribution. Yeah, diffuse abdominal pain and uh, diaphragmatic irritation right how will you manage that if at all there is a bladder perf uh, if there is a uh, how will the surgeon tell you that uh, there is a perf uh, sir uh, there is decreased the irrigation fluid that we are given yeah. there is amount it's, is decreased yeah the return of the fluid comes down that is why you should also be watching what exactly is happening at the foot end okay don't just focus on the head end you should also look at what the surgeons do anytime, anytime, not only the TUR, okay, any surgery you will be much wiser. Yeah.
he has to what does he do if the patient has uh, so if, if he has perfed uh, if we are uh, if there is an uh, extra perto uh, extra perto on the neck of bladder structure then he mm -hmm. can manage it with the suprapubic catheterization mm -hmm. of the patient so mm -hmm. and uh, if there is uh, intraperitoneal rupture uh, then we have to um, evaluate the of uh, further surgery could be done to evaluate and maybe you need a laparotomy to know yeah. what exactly is happening and you may you still have to create a bypass and then uh, you, you may have to close the uh, rupture yeah next yeah should be 2.5 to 2.6 should be good enough but uh, when you give more volume and uh, dense blockade which will lock act for a little longer time the advantages are uh, basically uh, the there is a catheter placed right and yes. the catheter is placed under lot of lot of uh, they tug the catheter uh, they tug the catheter picture. and yeah why is that uh, why is that basically it reduces the um, bleeding uh, if at all that has to be bleeding it will uh, prevent the bleeding right yeah yes. and uh, that can cause a lot of discomfort to the patient what we call it as catheter-related bladder discomfort. And that can be taken care of if you give a little, uh, the spinal anesthetic, which acts a little longer. Therefore, you can always add an additive. Local anesthetic, say you only said 2.5, you can reduce it to 2.2 and then maybe a little bit of fentanyl or uh, I don't advise you to take use dexmedetomidine because the FDA might uh, prone uh, thrown at you. Therefore, be careful when you use dexmedetomidine. You use uh, fentanyl as a additive. Patient will be analogized for a little longer time and uh, he will not complain of too much of pain. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, patient is positioned for yes. your spinal has worked and patient is positioned. What is the position for a TRP? Uh, we have to position and the lithotomy position for this patient. Yeah. So. And do you give Trendlenburg mostly? Uh, sir, there's a modified oh, lithotomy position, uh, Lord yeah. Davis, in which the, we have give 13 degree tantalum per position also. Yeah, that is, uh, you should always wait for uh, the drug to fix and then only you give the tantalum bug. Otherwise, you need, you should not, okay? Early tantalum bug is not advised. Then what else do you do? Uh, what happens when you give the lithotomy position and, uh, oh God, uh, we'll try uh, to uh, first. There is a certain complication when we give lithotomy position. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, raise legs simultaneously mm -hmm. to avoid the pelvic uh, rotation. Injury. Right. And, Done. Then. And also, uh, when we uh, stack the, the legs in the stirrup, there can be a uh, nerve injury, uh, the, like common peroneal lateral border of yeah. Uh, uh, Positional leg. positioning injuries. Uh, even an anesthesiologist is equally responsible. Therefore, there have been precedents where. Uh, the doc, uh, anesthetist has been penalized along with the institution and uh, the obstetrician. Therefore, I think you have to be careful when you position the patient. More importantly, they're all position, uh, lithotomy related uh, nerve injuries. But the issue is the cardiac output, I mean, the uh, uh, sudden the, rise of leg can cause yeah, circular exactly. overload. Uh, the return of fluid into the general circulation and that might have a oh, deleterious effect on the cardiac output and on the cardiac rather. And then respiration can be hampered because uh, lithotomy, when you flex the, both the limbs, both the lower limbs, the intra-abdominal pressure goes up and uh, diaphragmatic splinting can happen. So you have to keep that in mind, especially when you add up uh, trend lumbar, then uh, it becomes worse. Keep that also in mind, other than just focusing on the TR-related complications, okay? Um, yeah, what we listed out the complications uh, of TORP, but how do you prevent that? You have to start from the beginning. Before the resectoscope goes in, you have to make sure that the patient does not end up with TOR syndrome. How will you do? Uh, uh, initially, the patient, uh, there is a prevent, uh, we can prevent the uh, TORP syndrome, uh, like uh, the Initial fluid we are giving, like 0.59 ns we are starting, we can judicially give the fluid initially uh, before resetocop goes in. Also, uh, this is for irrigation or uh, IV fluids, fluids that we are starting. 
IV fluid normal saline. I mean, it's not normal saline. 0.9% uh, saline. Yes, That's sir. your IV fluid of choice. Yes, sir. Any any reason? Sir, this patient can have a dilution hyponatremia. Then, then why don't this... you then why don't you use uh, hypotonic saline in the beginning? No, that cannot be a reason. Uh, normal saline, there is uh, nothing normal about normal saline, right? Yeah, it's not or, isotonic. Yeah, the fluid of choice should be a balanced all solution for you. It can be Ringer lactate or it can be the plasma light or whatever brand you have, all right? Balance all solutions. But uh, preloading or co-loading has, has to be kept to a minimum. You cannot be using 10 to 20 ml of uh, preloading or co-loading. You have to reduce it, but uh, it is not quantified how much less, but make sure that the patient's hemodynamics are maintained with uh, lesser fluids and more of vasopressors even with your spinal anesthetic. Fine, that's accepted. Then what is the rule of 60? Uh, uh, there is total time for the TURP syndrome should be uh, less than 60 minutes. Total gram of resection time. Resection. resection time should be less than 60 minutes. And then? Then uh, total gram of uh, prostate removed less than 60 gram. 60 gram. And 60 centimeter of the height should be not more than 60 centimeter height. Uh, irrigation fluid kept below the 60 centimeter. Why are you worried about uh, the height of the uh, fluid column? Mm -hmm. 60 so, centimeters, you said, should be the height at which the drum is or glycine is kept. Yeah. Yes, the maximum height should be yeah. uh, 60 why, centimeters. Why? why are you worried about that 60 centimeters? Because Generally, is... in our institutions, uh, they are all hung on to an IV stand and it's at least uh, four feet above, right? Because the and hydrostatic... The... Yeah, exactly. It's a, the... it's, a, it's a game between the hydrostatic pressure and the, the colloid osmotic pressure. And uh, this column adds to the hydrostatic pressure. Therefore, if it is more, then uh, the driving in force becomes uh, much, much higher and the patients can have uh, early development of uh, uh, TR syndrome. That's why it has to be 60 centimeters. Yeah. What are the fluid, uh, irrigating fluid you choose? Uh... Fluid of choice is one point five percent glycine, sir. Yeah. And yeah. early days, it, I agree. Mm. Earlier days, uh, distilled water is also used. Even now, there are a lot of institutions which use distilled water. What is the problem with distilled water? So, uh, it's uh, hypo. It's the hyposmosis fluid, so the larger accumulation of fluid into the intervascular space, mm -hmm. and is caused. Mm -hmm. Water intoxication and yeah. its early CNS symptoms can be developed. Water intoxication because leads to CNS edema. Sorry, what is really yeah, permeable? No, before that the hemolysis, right? Hemolysis also. More worried about the hemolysis. RBC lysis happens first. Yes. That is why you are more worried. Obviously, the cerebral edema is also it sets in much faster. For water is out. Distilled water, strictly speaking, is out. But as I said, lot of institutions even today they use distilled water. Then there was a time when they were used 5D dextrose, 5%. But the problem with the 5% dextrose is uh, when you use a resectoscope, uh, the Sticky. resect... Huh? Stickiness. Yeah, it sticks and then it gets charred because of uh, the, uh, the current and then it gets more stickier, okay? Yeah, and then normal saline was also used. But it's not used anymore because it's also caused the uh, dispersion of electricity basically it's because it's electrolytes, mono. right? Electrolytes. Yeah. That's why we moved on to glycine. Glycine 1.2% to 1.5%. 1.5% is more isoosmolar, therefore 1.5% uh, glycine right now is used. Any other options you have? Uh yes, sir. Uh they have, uh, we can also use uh, Mantor, yeah. Sorbitol, yeah. and, and uh, Cistel also can be used. There's a combination. The Sorbitol, is a Sorbitol and Mantos. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, they're all uh, actually very expensive and uh, most of the institutions also say glycine is very expensive. The, but still glycine is right now the near ideal 
uh, irrigating fluid, right? Yeah, if at all the patient develops, uh, yeah, we'll finish in another five minutes at least. I have been talking about five minutes since last 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah, the most common uh, complication you can encounter is the TR syndrome. TR syndrome. Yeah, exactly. Is there any other surgery, though you call it uh, TRP syndrome, is there any other surgery which uh, can cause TR syndrome? You try. In urology? Uh, so. TRBT? No. That should not take this long. Something which takes longer, where you put the patient prone and try to hit the kidneys. PCNL obviously can cause, okay, because it's prolonged and the irrigation is, it also goes on for quite some time, right? And the URS also sometimes can cause, it's a little too far-fetched. What is the female equivalent of uh, TR syndrome? In gynecological surgeries? You're saying something in the middle. Hysteroscopy, when you have, yeah. When you have to do diagnostic hysteroscopy may not cause, but uh, uh, therapeutic, when you have to get rid of, uh, say, tumors, and uh, it can obviously uh, lead to TR syndrome and uh, something like TR syndrome. Uh, there are quite a few papers on that. There are times when uh, IJ had a paper sometime some years ago where 37 liters of uh, irrigating fluids were used and nothing much returned. Basically, that also gets into the peritoneum from the fimbrial end and the absorption occurs over a larger uh, area and the patient can have uh, something like TR syndrome. It's possible. Yeah. Then, when the patient, I mean, TR syndrome happens, what will you do? What, what, what could be the signs and symptoms of TR syndrome? Sir, there will be CNS signs like patient yeah. have uh, agitation, confusion, mm -hmm. uh, disorientation, even mm -hmm. can have uh, nausea, vomiting, and uh, develop into even progress into seizure and coma. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is the CNS symptoms. Uh, and, sir, earlier symptoms, which uh, system in is involved earlier? Uh, cardiovascular symptoms also. Exactly. Involved, no? so. Yeah. What would happen? Uh, there is a circulatory overload in the, the right. overload in the cardiac system, and the there right. can uh, patient can fail, lands up into failure. So, do huh? pseudo preload. What failure? Uh, sir, cardiac fa hey, left thing, failure. Left What is the what is the first thing you see? The I failure is the, later. Bradycardia can occur, sir. Before that, mm -hmm. There is hypertension, right? Ah, yes. sir, hypertension. There, you said volume overload. Obviously, there is hypertension. Both systolic and diastolic will go up and the pulse pressure also will increase. All right? Yeah. And then there is associated bradycardia. That's why when the patient is under general anesthesia, if the patient refuses uh, spinal or the patient is uh, unfit for a regional anesthesia, when you give general anesthesia, you have to look at the CVS symptoms. And this is these are the CVS symptoms you look for the elevated pressures and then bradycardia, right? That means that the patient is moving towards TUR syndrome and then the CNS symptoms. They are all because of basically volume overload and more importantly, hyponatremia. Can you tell me at uh, what levels of sodium, serum sodium levels the patient has and um, what does he have? Or if uh, serum sodium level uh, decreased at uh, less than 120 milliequivalents per mm -hmm. liter, mm -hmm. the patient will have confusion, mm -hmm. uh, restlessness mm -hmm. uh, in CNS and uh, in ECG there can be a wide mm -hmm. QRS converse. Good, good. Yeah. If the level further decreased uh, mm -hmm. below 150, mm -hmm. this patient can somnolence and no stay can have in, in these patients. Okay. And in uh, ECG, we can get, uh, along with the white QR clombus, ST elevation can be also seen. Okay. And uh, cardiac depression, patient can go into cardiac depression. 
if mm -hmm. this uh, level will further decrease below 110 then mm -hmm. uh, there will be uh, seizures and coma can be seen sir correct mm. uh, and uh, patient in, in ecg we a patient land of vf ventricular fibrillations good yeah all right and your management uh, basically depends on what the patient uh, has how will you actually manage the syndrome if the patient starts developing the syndrome how will you manage so uh, initially i will uh, inform the surgeon uh, mm. to close up all the venous sinuses of open and stop the surgery and stop the irrigation fluids good yeah uh, then yeah. that is if... something very important it's not only the stoppage of surgery you have to ask him to coagulate all the open venous sinuses okay good then uh, then, sir, uh, I will proceed. I will look for the mentation of the patient. If the patient mm -hmm. is asymptomatic but the osmolality decreases, then I will give the prosomatic to the patient. Okay. Uh, I will can give the latch to the patient. Meanwhile, to patient. meanwhile, meanwhile, I will also send an ABG or serum sodium uh, of the patient, intraoperative values of yeah. serum sodium. Bloods can be sent for the labs. Yeah. Labs. You have to send the blood for the labs. Then, basically, uh, you are looking at the sodium levels. Yes. yes and hmm, then uh, then sir uh, uh, i look for the if there is any uncertainty for the near, uh, airway then can i can manage symptomatically i can manage intubate the patient and manage accordingly mm -hmm. and uh, if the patient uh, develops seizure i can okay i can also give benzodiazepine okay. and some magnesium sure but before that early early it's not at seizures it's not at coma it is not at uh, what will you do? The patient is not somnolent at, patient is not at puking. Sodium levels might have come down to 120. After then think? we can give, uh, if the there is symptom 3% NS can be given if there is. Uh, uh, what? 3% 3, 3 age, 3% uh, uh, normal saline can uh, Normal saline. 3% is normal saline. Yes, and hi hypertonic saline can be given. Sir. Okay. Yeah. Three percent saline can be given, right? Yeah, hypertonic saline can be given. What uh, precautions do you take before uh, you do the uh, hypertonic saline? So, uh, I will give this hypertonic saline uh, slowly, sir. Uh, there is a chance yeah. of center point and analysis. I will only give one millicolon per hour, not more than that. Eh? And you will give one, one millicolon per hour. Increase the sodium levels one yeah. milli okay. more. Okay. Mm. At one milligram okay. per hour at most, okay. uh, not more than 100 ml per hour. And uh, uh, then I will stop the so, uh, infusion when there is uh, uh, more than 120 milligrams of sodium. Okay. Okay. When the sodium levels reach 120, you said. Okay. Then and basically, whatever fluid you have been giving, once uh, the patient develops uh, symptoms, early symptoms, you change the fluid to Sodium containing. Sodium. Okay, you cut everything else and you give, maybe you can give so-called normal saline. Okay. Then you can change to hypertonic. Hypertonic saline, again, uh, it kills the veins. You have to look at a larger vein. You cannot uh, go through the peripheral vein. And then uh, further complications, obviously, is uh, central point train. Uh, mm. Sorry. Mm. What is that? Myelinosis. Yeah. Central point train. Exactly. That's why you have to give a little... But uh, meanwhile, uh, try to maintain uh, the oxygenation and uh, also the hemodynamics. Okay. Yeah. Frosamide you give. How much frosamide do you give? Uh, sir, I can give uh, 20 to 40 milligrams of 20 to 40 mg. Can safely give up to about uh, 1 milligram per kg. It should not be uh, that much. I mean, you need not be that less. Yeah. Okay. Then? Uh, then, sir, rest I manage symptomatically. If okay. he develops uh, seizures, then I give benzodiazepines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's all we discussed already. Yep, done. The airway and uh, hemodynamics have to be maintained as the need be. Then the next complication is uh, bleeding, right? Yes. yes, sir. How will you manage the bleeding? Sir, uh... How do you assess the bleeding? How much is the sir. blood loss? The calculation of blood loss is a little difficult in 
to your bed there with inevitably the 400 ml of blood loss is occur we can say that the patient in each 1 gram of rosuvatrimol 15 to 20 ml of blood is also loss or 2.4 to 4.5 ml per resection time can also occur in good bleeding yeah right yes and uh, we can also cal calculate maximum allowable blood loss and along with that we also arrange blood for this patient you check, there's... The, you check the hemoglobin of the patient and then uh, know the maximum allowable blood loss and then yeah then uh, uh, if this uh, reach, uh, uh, if there is more uh, blood loss than maximum allowable blood loss then we can give uh, blood transfusion, transfusion to the patient blood, also. yeah then what other complications will just wind Thanks. up uh, sir, then uh, bladder perforation is another complication. Yeah, that we have discussed already. Then, sir, uh, then the patient also can uh, coagulopathy, DIC can that, occur. Also. Before that, that is a little further down the line. Before that, um, bacteremia, sepsis, yeah, bacteremic and sepsis or bacteremic is a possibility, okay. and uh, yes, sir. Yeah, and make sure that the antibiotic is uh, prophylactic antibiotic is given within an hour and don't give it in the morning and bring the patient to the war by afternoon. Okay, yeah. Then if at all the patient starts uh, shivering on table, what is uh, the reason? Uh, it's because of the hypothermia. Patient. Point number one. Then um, bacteremia also can cause... Also uh, cause uh, right? chill fever and chills. Yeah. Maybe you add up another uh, dose of antibiotic then uh, if there is no contraindication and then you manage the shivering, all right? Hypothermia, you said. How does hypothermia work? Uh, I mean, how does it come, happen? Uh, for this elderly patient, already there is uh, a thermoregulatory mechanism is defective in these patients. Mm -hmm. And the irrigation fluid we use uh, is... Uh, room temperature so it's cause a uh, hypothermia to the patient mm -hmm. and so we have to prevent that also sir. yeah hypothermia is basically because of the irrigating fluid your spinal anesthetic and there can be vasodilation and loss of heat also right and the ambient yes. OT temperature is also low and then the patient also can shiver because of the bacteria you manage accordingly keep the patient warm and uh, if warm needed oxygenation fluid. And narcotics is uh, the way. Uh, at the risk, there is always a risk of uh, you may not be able to detect uh, mm, TR syndrome early. Still, you may have to give narcotics. Yeah. What else? What other complications? Yeah. You said uh, DIC. DIC is also a possibility, but that is basically what could be the cause for uh, DIC? Sir, uh, it's because of the dilution thrombocytopenia of this yeah, patient. One. And then? Then this, when the prostate shippings are done, there is release of urokinase, which okay. converts plasminogen into plasmin, and which causes fibrinolysis in this patient. Sir. Very so good. It, it also yeah. causes... Yes. How many of your patients can uh, develop uh, uh, TR syndrome? What percentage? Okay. So eight percentage of patients can one. Yeah. It can go up to about twenty percent. Therefore, you have to be on the watch. Okay, you have to watch on your patient. And as you said in the beginning, it can also happen in the post-operative period when the irrigation continues. You have to be uh, on the watch. All right. Yes. Okay. I think uh, we should uh, wind up because we have taken too long uh, time. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, your uh, presentation has been. Uh, quite good and the discussion also easily you pass with a distinction 70 percent i am a little stingy when i give marks but still i think you get about 70 uh, so i uh, stop the skill sharing or move on to the next uh, case discussion yeah uh, are there any questions yes uh, let me check sir just allow me a moment no that uh, i think we will take it up at the end uh, we'll finish the next case discussion okay, okay sure uh, so i'm moving we'll to the up. next case but discussion. Uh, but meanwhile mamita try yes. to put it up on the chat box all the questions from that uh, side okay, yeah, sir, for that i have to stop the skin sharing yeah yeah, yeah please do no you just put it on the chat box yeah yeah definitely we'll sir, i'm doing i'm doing okay. let me uh, let, let me check yeah. it once sir yeah now we'll uh, go to the second case presentation.
Deepak is there? Uh, sir, yes, first, uh, first, yeah. uh, first uh, shall I need to change the questions or shall I move on to the... No, you uh, will we'll take the questions later. Otherwise, okay, we'll be wasting okay, time. Okay, sir. Okay. We'll just... Uh, Akhil, don't run off. Be around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, Deepak, uh, your uh, case uh, discussion mostly Chani will do, but uh, I will be interluding. Okay. Okay. You sir. can't. You can't basically stop me, ma. Always from talking. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Good Chani? evening, sir. Good evening, madam. Uh, today my case is of a four-year-old male child coming from Kanyakumari who had chief complaints of headache and irritability and progressive increase in head size as per the mother for one week. Child was apparently normal till one week back, developed headache, which was diffuse and squeezing type of pain for one week associated with increased irritability and progressive increase in the size of head. History of vomiting was present for the last two days, which is projectile in nature, about six to eight episodes per day. History of decreased food intake for the last two days and in history of drows drowsiness for one day. There is no history of seizures, loss of consciousness or urinary incontinence, no history of fever and no history of any trauma. A past history, the child is a known case of cerebral aqueductal stenosis and had undergone ventricular peritoneal shunt procedure under general anesthesia at four months of age. Postoperative period was uneventful. There is also a history of hospitalization for fever and convulsions and neck stiffness one year ago, which was managed medically. Currently, the child is not on any long-term medications. There is no history of any cardiac anomalies, reactive airway, uh, uh, tuberculosis, or thyroid disorders. Maternal history, the mother had a normal prenatal period. Birth history, uh, he was a full-term normal with vaginal delivery. Birth weight of 2.89 kilograms. There is no history suggestive of birth asphyxia, no history of NICU admissions, no similar illness in any family members. Immunization history, the child is immunized up to age. Developmentally, the child walks up and down stairs, hops on one leg, attends, plays school, plays with his peers, has normal vision and hearing and speech. Look, just tell us the positive findings. Just the positive okay. findings. Okay, okay, madam. Um, in examination, the child is drowsy. Uh, anthropometry, the height is 106 centimeters, weight is 16 kilogram. Head circumference is 54 centimeter and chest circumference is 50 centimeter. Uh, vitals, heart rate is 76, all other parameters of our pulse rate are normal. BP measured is 130 over 90 millimeters of mercury in the right upper limb in the supine position. Respiratory rate is 22 per minute. Capillary refill time as measured was more than 3 seconds. Head to foot examination, anterior fontanelle was closed, eyes was normal, head appears large, hair is normal, dosis is present. No neck or spinal deformities, chest wall, abdomen, genitalia, and limbs were normal. Airway examination, the child had a large head, mouth opening was adequate. There is no obvious facial uh, neck deformities. Spine and neck appears normal. Central nervous system, the child is drowsy. A GCS score of E3, V4, M6 is present. In cranial nerve examination, child had stosis and upward gaze palsy. Motor system examination revealed normal bulk of muscles, normal tone. Uh, on examination of power, the child is not able to sit up and hold posture. Deep tendon and superficial reflexes were normal. Sensory system was normal. The VP, VP shunt reservoir was felt in the right side of the neck. Other systems, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, and abdominal uh, examination were normal. Uh, summary, a four-year-old developmentally normal male child weighing 16 kilograms, who is a non-case of cerebral aqueductal stenosis and had underwent VP shunting at four months of age, now presented with headache, irritability, increased head size for one week, vomiting for two days, and drowsiness for one day. On examination, is found to be drowsy, having a head circumference more than the 95th centile, and signs of raised ICP. Uh, provisional diagnosis, uh, acute hydrocephalus, probably due to block VP shunt with some dehydration. Okay, Deepak, so you have this four-year-old male, right? So, uh, if the same scenario I give you for an eight-month-old baby, mm -hmm. right? How would the presentation be different as compared to this kid? Uh, in a four-year-old, maybe the uh, biggest change would be the change in size of head would be more prominent. There would be bulging fontanelle. There would be sutural diastasis present, and symptom-wise, the child would be more lethargic. Uh, if the problem is chronic, there will be decreased feeding and decreased weight, weight gain. Mm, there will be shrill crying in acute cases. 
No, so you have a you have an infant, you have an eight month old baby. So what yes. would the symptoms like? Symptoms and the sign in an eight month old baby. Symptoms would be drowsiness, decreased overall intake, therefore decreased uh, failure to thrive would be there. There will be enlarged heads and on examination, the child would have bulging fontanelle. Uh, chance of uh, upward gaze paralysis would be present. Okay. Uh, okay. Hold on. So you're talking about enlarged head. So yes. what do you mean enlarged head for a particular age? Uh, enlarged head or macrocephaly is defined as a head circumference or uh, occipital frontal circumference, which is more than the two more than two standard deviations from median from average for that for that age. Correct. So, how does the head circumference increase with age? Normally, at birth, the head circumference is around thirty three to thirty five centimeters. In the first three months of life, it increases by two centimeter per month. For the next three months, it increases by one centimeter per month. For the next six months, it increases by 0.5 centimeters per month. Then uh, it increases by 0.25 centimeters per month for the next two years. And from six years onwards, it increases by one centimeters per year. Six years onward or four to six years? Four to six years. It uh, attains normal head circumference by six years. By six years, right. And what about the fontanelles? When does the anterior fontanel close and when does the posterior fontanel close? Normally, the anterior fontanel completely closes by 12 to 18 months of age, and posterior fontanel usually closes before that by around 6 to 9 months of age. And what about, uh, what about the sutures? Sutures usually completely fuse by around 2 years of age, 18 correct. to 24 months of age. Correct, correct. Okay. So, uh, uh, so now that you have this 4-year-old male who's posted for, uh, A revision. for revision of the shunt. So when we talk about this, uh, you, have you mentioned any drug history for this baby? This child is currently not on any drugs. Uh, the child before admission was not in, on any drugs. After admission, the started. Could, yeah, what medications could this child be on chronically? Chronically, this child could be on uh, medications like acetazolamide to decrease the CS of production. In case of any seizures were present, uh, if they were okay. present, the child could have been anti-seizure medications. Listen, let's go slow. Okay, tell me about acetazolamide. What is it uh, and what are the effects? Acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor that is given at a dose of 25 milligram per kilogram per day in uh, three divided doses. It can be given to a maximum of 100 milligram per kilogram per day. Uh, as it it uh, decreases the formation of CSF. Uh, complications associated with acetazolamide is usually non -anion, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So while giving, we have to May uh, look for any anion gap, uh, any acidosis that might occur. Okay, what are the other drugs the baby could be on? Child could also be on diuretics and also hyperosmolar agents to uh, medically manage the intracranial pressure. Uh, did you talk about uh, anti epileptic medications? The child is not currently on anti-epileptic medications, madam. But uh, if there is a history of seizures, she could have be, uh, the child could be on anti-seizure medications. If that is the case, the anti-seizure medications could should be continued throughout the uh, perioperative period. Correct, correct. So, uh, uh, what do you look for uh, in other systems for this baby, for this kid? This child, uh, the usually. Hydrocephalus can have syndromic associations. If that is the case, we have to check for any associated cardiac anomalies, any uh, other airway disorders. Airway difficulty itself can present because hydrocephalus is usually associated with uh, syndromes that affect the facial and craniofacial anatomy. But uh, according to the history, do you expect any syndromes to be associated? He's a four-year-old kid. The, uh, my child here is a four-year-old kid with good scholastic performance, uh, normal development, and uh, post-operatively, there were no other admissions or hospital visits for anything other than one episode of meningitis. So I don't expect any other syndromic associations for my child. Correct. It's your child. <laughs> no, no, sir. And and never make this mistake. Okay. Sorry. It's Sorry. your patient. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the diagnosis had been given as aqueductal stenosis for uh, this kid, right? 
So what do you mean by aqueductal stenosis and why is it important to an anesthesiologist to know the diagnosis as to why the hydrocephalus is there? Uh, aqueductal stenosis is um, actually aqueduct. Uh, the aqueduct mentioned here is the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius, which uh, is the pathway of CSF from the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. Um, uh, sorry, so from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, the aqueductal stenosis can lead to a blockage in the CSF pathway from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, thereby increasing the CSF volume within the lateral and third ventricles. Uh, so why does it become important for an anesthesiologist to know what is the cause of hydrocephalus? The cause could be plenty, right? So how does yes, it yes. anesthesia? We just have to give anesthesia for BP shunt? Prognosis, madam. If there is... Uh, if it so, is a stenotic lesion and if uh, shunting can... Uh, actually alleviate the symptoms, the emergency nature of the surgery increases and outcome postoperatively also increases. What all do we have to take care? Uh, I'm just trying to take out the answer from you. What all do we have to take care uh, during the surgery? Anything to do with the positioning? Uh, pos uh, the position usually taken up by the surgeon is the supine position with the left tilt uh, or towards whichever the side the shunting is being placed. If the, the shunt is being placed on the right lateral, right horn of the lateral ventricle, then the uh, surgeon should turns the head to the left side. Uh, this change in position can further increase ICP due to venous compressions and further compression of the um, What about excessive flexion or extension of head? Excessive flexion and extension can, in cases where there is, uh, in syndromes like Dandy-Wacker or Chiari uh, syndromes, excessive flexion and extension can lead to compression at the level of the neck. That can lead to uh, bradycardia and uh, the medullary. That is the whole point. You should know why this hydrocephalus is there because you need to keep all these minute points, but important points in mind while doing the case. Huh. Right. Okay. So, uh, uh, you told me about the clinical symptoms and the sign. So, what are the investigations these children usually have before they come to us? Uh, usually, uh, the child would, uh, in this particular child, the uh, hemoglobin, baseline hemoglobin, and uh, baseline hemogram would be taken by the patient, uh, surgeon, and also a total count to rule out any infections, as infection can be a cause. How would the child be investigated for hydrocephalus before coming to us? For hydrocephalus per se? Hydrocephalus is investigated by imaging. CT imaging is more preferred in cases where the, the already sutural fusion has occurred. If the sutural fusion has sutural fusion hadn't occurred, ultrasonography or neurosonogram through the antenal font, anterior fontanelle would have been an option. For this child, a CT would be taken. And uh, in the CT, certain indices, the, the main uh, indicative factor of hydrocephalus is enlargement of the ventricles. Normally, the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle is not seen on a plain CT. The presence of a temporal horn, especially with, with more than 2 millimeters, is indicative of hydrocephalus. Also, several uh, measurements taken on a plain CT can also be indicative of uh, hydrocephalus. The width of the frontal horns of both lateral ventricles can be measured and uh, the ratio with the inter, uh, uh, the distance between the inner tables can be taken. And if it is more than 0.5, it is uh, significant. And another index that we take is the Evans ratio. Evans ratio is the ratio of the distance, uh, maximum width of frontal horns to the uh, biparietal diameter. Uh, ratio of more than 0.3 is considered significant. Have you heard of something called a Mickey Mouse sign? What is that? Uh, Mickey Mouse sign is also a sign found on a plain CT in a patient with in a child with hydrocephalus. Uh, it occurs due to the presence of enlarged anterior and temporal and uh, posterior horns of the lateral ventricle. Okay. Uh, so these people would have undergone all imaging before they come to you. What are the now this baby is posted for a VP shunt for shunt revision, right? What are the investigations? Yes, what are the investigations would you ask for this baby before you? Uh, 
child uh, before taking this child up for surgery i would like to have a baseline hemoglobin i would like to do a total count to rule out any infection in this child um, i would like to uh, have a blood grouping done uh, because this is not uh, this uh, v patient surgery would not have a high risk of bleeding in a normal course i would like to do a blood grouping and not cross matching and because this child has history of multiple episodes episodes of vomiting i would like to have a serum electrolytes done and because of decreased uh, intake for the last two days i would also like to have a blood uh, random blood sugar done correct listen uh, tell me one thing uh, this uh... How do you assess dehydration in a pediatric patient? You have mentioned few of the parameters in your examination. So if you have an infant, how do you assess de dehydration? Uh, dehydration is usually assessed and classified into three. The child can either have no dehydration, some dehydration or severe dehydration. This is based upon one, the uh, mentation of the child, the skin turgor of the child, the appearance of the pupils, the blood pressure, the urine output, whether the child is uh, taking oral fluids um, and capillary refill time. Yeah. So what about this uh, this patient? You mentioned something about the capillary refill no? when you were presenting. In capillary refill time time was more than three seconds it was around four seconds madam uh, a capillary refill time of four to five seconds is seen in uh, the category with some dehydration also this child's mentation uh, the, the drowsiness could be due to the cerebral uh, increased icp so uh, uh, what we would take is uh, the capillary refill time and decreased urine output okay correct now you tell me you mentioned about the GCS also during the examination, right? So what yes. about how do you assess the GCS of a preverbal might be of an infant? How do you assess that? How is that different from assessing the GCS of an elder of uh, of a five year old kid or of a six year old kid? For a preverbal kid, uh, cries a normal cry. Uh, also, we could do the uh, ABPU alert vocalizing. The GCS uh, scale for various age groups differs. Okay. So, for it is different for 0 to 2 years, 2 to 5 years and more than 5 years. So, for 0 to 2 years. So, it is like no response. We, we are talking about the best verbal response. Okay. So, no response, grunts, inappropriate crying, cries, and five would be coos and smiles appropriately. So, when you are mentioning that, that you have to do. Okay. That you need to be aware of. Okay. Madhu, sir, you could ask a few questions. You'll have to unmute. Yeah, I know. It has been going smooth. Therefore, I thought I would not uh, interlude. Yeah, but still the confounding factors right now here uh, in your presentation is uh, the child has uh, a blocked stent as well as uh, the patient has been uh, vomiting. The uh, level of consciousness, it becomes a tricky thing now, uh, whether it is because of light imbalance or is it because of uh, the the uh, raised ICT. That's why you need to have the investigations done to see what exactly is wrong. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you had asked for what all investigation? Deepa, could you repeat? You had asked for hemoglobin. You had asked for hemoglobin along with hematocrit, I would check, madam. Then uh, electrolytes, serum electrolytes, I would check. Uh, right. Blood. Hmm. Ha, go on, go on. Uh, then uh, total count to roll out any infection. Mm -hmm. That all, madam. If the child had, uh, not this child, but if the child had any uh, uh, lower cranial nerve involvement, I would also like, would have done an x-ray to, uh, if I had suspected any aspiration. But this child, on examination, the child had a clear uh, lung feel. So, I would stick to the blood investigations. Okay. The child is 16 kilos. 
what is uh, yeah. the blood volume in this guy? Is he uh, is his weight appropriate for age? Uh, the weight is appropriate. It is nearly fiftieth centiles. Okay. Yeah. What is the blood volume in this uh, guy? Uh, the blood volume would be sixty times. It's a four year old child. Nearly two liters. Two point two liters. How many ml per kg? Ml per kg seventy five to eighty ml per kg. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. What would be the maximum allowable blood loss in this uh, child? Uh, that would be calculated by the formula initial uh, hemoglobin by mm. final hemoglobin by hemoglobin into the estimated blood volumes. Mm. How much can you allow it to come down to? Uh, to maintain normal cerebral perfusion, a hematocrit of about 30 to 30, 33 to 35 is ideal. 30 to 33, yeah, fine. Yeah, carry on. Chan. So, uh, you go and see the patient and then uh, what are the pre-operative orders would you like to give? Pre-operatively, if my volume status, if my electrolytes and sugars are within normal limits, uh, I would consider the child optimized for this emergency surgery. So, on pre-operative uh, visit to the patient... What I has to, your uh, volume status got to do with the child? Uh, if the child's volume status, the electrolytes and sugars are normal, I would like I would uh, consider this child optimized for the surgery. Um, I would counsel the mother of the child uh, regarding the possible complications, both surgery related and anesthesia related. A chance, also a risk of uh, if any untoward incident happens. I would also like to explain the chance of post-operative ventilation to the mother. Uh, I would like to con I would ask the child to continue I would ask the mother to continue all the routine medications that is being ordered like uh, acetostolamide and uh, and uh, diuretics and hyperosmolar drugs. Uh, I would avoid any sedative premedication to this child. Uh, any unmonitored sedative premedications I would like to allow. I would explain the NPO guidelines. Okay, okay. So you think it is an emergency surgery? Uh, as the child is drowsy and it is not responsive to medical management, the shunt revision has to be done in a semi-emergency basis. Right. Okay. So, pre-operative, you, you were telling me, telling us that you would not like to give any pre-medication, right? Okay. Uh, so, why so? so uh, child is drowsy, would not be requiring. Okay. So, but then uh, supposedly... You have a one-year-old, uh, does not want to get separated from parents, is active, is active, and uh, and you have to take the child for VP shunting. Okay, how do you separate that child in that case? Uh, things that can be done are one more a pre-medication that uh, does not maximally interfere with the respiratory, like oral trichloroforce. Or uh, oral trichloroforce can be administered. Problem with midazolam that is usually given is that there is a chance for respiratory depression. But midazolam, what we do is monitored administration of midazolam can be done, sir, provided there is no respiratory depression or uh, hypopnea. If we can allow that, if we can maintain that, that can be done. Correct. As in, uh, so the point is you have to decide whether you want to go ahead with a child. Uh, whether you want a child to be given pre-medication in a monitored area or you might be, you know, you, you have to end up shifting a chi child without any sedation but would not be very cooperative and crying child. So, you would not be wanting that the also, right. right? So, as you're saying, you have to give, you can give pre-medication in these patients and you obviously monitor them. So, you're telling about oral midazolam. So, what would be the dose in uh, pediatric patients for oral midazolam? 0.5 to 0 0.8 or 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram given orally. So, do you routinely use point uh, midazolam, oral midazolam? Uh, in our institution, we use only trichloroforce, madam. So, what is the problem using oral midazolam? Uh, uh, normal formulations are not available. The formulation that we take up is very bitter in taste. 
then what do you do? Uh, if at all, it is usually doing, not in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Along, okay. along so given you can mix it with yeah, you can mix it with uh, any of the additives which will make it more palatable to the. Is there any other option? Can it can it take the baby with the parent till the induction room? Uh, that is also described in some cases wherein uh, parental presence inside the operating uh, yeah. operating room child yeah. is under under the child is under anesthesia. Yeah, that's uh, instead of uh, somebody who is vomiting, somebody who is drowsy. Instead of giving more sedatives before you anesthetize, and uh, uh, maybe you will have some emergencies because of uh, your over sedating. Because your oral medicine, you give a stiff dose and you don't have a control over the absorption of it, right? The bioavailability is still doubtful with uh, oral medicine. Therefore, then you will have more problems. The patient can go hypopnic and then carbon dioxide retention, which is not good for the ICT. And uh, why end up with more problems? Therefore, take the parent to a more controlled environment, that's your uh, OR. And in the parental presence, you can uh, induce the child, right? Yeah, that's a possibility. Keep it in mind always uh, for a child. Yeah, next. Go on. Okay, even while giving administering oral midazolam, one thing needs to be remembered. How long before do you give that? Before shifting the baby? How long? Before? 15, 30 minutes prior shifting. Yeah, that should be at least 30 minutes, like not prior to that. Okay, it takes 30 to 40 minutes for it to act. Okay. Okay, so you have this uh, child. Uh, mostly this child would be having, in this scenario, might be he has an IV cannula, but then uh, we are taking a one-year-old kid who has to be shifted to OT and does not have an IV cannula. And we have decided we'll shift the OT, shift the patient uh, with uh, the baby's parents. Okay, but before that, what are the, uh, what are, how would you prepare the OT and how would you go ahead? Uh, I would prepare my OT. Initially, I would check my machine check. I would ensure that there is pipeline oxygen supply, ad, uh, additional oxygen cylinders available. I would load all my emergency drug, in, induction drugs. I would set my operation theater uh, at a neutral temperature of about 28 degrees Celsius. Uh, I would prepare a, a, a difficult airway cart. Uh, I would make sure that there is a warming mattress that is switched on, additional warmed fluids and warmed uh, solutions for uh, antiseptic solutions are warm. I would make sure um, uh, adequate pillows uh, in case of a difficulty in uh, extension of the neck because of the large head, uh, head drinking and uh, difficult airway cart would be stocked with uh, laryngoscopes of uh, different sizes, second generation LMAs, bougies, uh, airway adjuncts like bougies, stillets, video laryngoscopes. Uh, this would be kept ready. And as working suction equipment would be, uh, I would ensure that a working suction equipment is there. Okay, you were talking about uh, uh, <gasps> the positioning. What uh, what all would you keep ready for the positioning? Uh, uh, for this hydrocephalus case, uh, not this, but in a uh, in a smaller child where there is a risk, where there is a chance of very high uh, head circumference. And the nor on, when the child is in supine position, the normally the head would be uh, neck would be flexed. So to attain a intubating position, there has to be extension of the neck. Uh, to facilitate this, uh, what we usually do is having uh, pillows or roll blankets beneath the torso and placing the head of the child on a small head ring. Okay, we that is uh, what I told them. You, you have an infant without hydrocephalus. Okay. Uh, in a normal infant posted for some other surgery, how do you position the head of the baby? Uh, the head is normally positioned in the neutral position for a child because the child is already having uh, a large occiput. So the normal uh, position itself would be of a flexion. So for intubation, a neutral position would be attained. So do you keep any shoulder roll? A shoulder roll is uh, kept beneath a uh, roll or a uh, we do is an IV bottle kept beneath the shoulder blades, madam. So, till what age do you have to keep the shoulder roll? What age till do you do? Two years, ma'am. 
till two years. Why so? Why not beyond that? Okay, you need to find out this answer. No, you are uh, on the right track. Why? Why till two years? The larynx, uh, the larynx, position of the larynx is higher up till. Uh, the anatomic uh, differences and difference in the anatomy of a infant or a child to an adult will uh, reverse by two. Then when does it happen? Okay, anyways, you can think about it. We'll uh, take it up later at the end. Yes, carry on. Okay, so now this child has, this is a four-year-old kid, right? And you have a, a head size of 54, you said. So uh, what 50. would be a head size or head circumference of, of a four-year-old kid? Uh, a normal head circumference at the 50th center is usually 50 centimeters. Is usually, uh, you've done the calculation. Okay, it's usually 50 uh, centimeters. Yes. Okay. So, okay, now you tell me. How would you like to go ahead? Uh, the scenario is, uh, as I told you, is a one-year-old kid without any IV line uh, with a huge head shifted with parents inside the OT. Uh, if the child is drowsy, I would like to uh, secure the IV cannula without much sedation, madam. If the child is uh, irritable, IV cannula has to be secured. Uh, madam, sorry. You said uh, if the child... You're a criminal. You're a criminal. Child is drowsy, you want to torture the child. If the child is irritable, you will sedate the child. What did you say? Uh, the problem is that... I have controlled uh, environment, right? Yeah. Uh, the IV can lab can be put uh, with minimal inhalational induction. Inhalational induction uh, to attain an IV access can be done. The problem with inhalational induction is it can further increase. The chance for further increase in ICP is present. Yep. Yeah, true. Even so, otherwise, how will you induce this child? Say the child has a cannula, you are secured, you... Uh, uh, pinned the patient down your gorilla style and you put an IV line, then what do you do? How will you induce if there is an IV access? Does it change? If, I, uh, if IV access is present, I would uh, initiate with a small dose of sedative, uh, like uh, anxiolytic like midazolam, ensure that mass, mass ventilation is possible. If mass ventilation is adequate, I would like to, uh, because this particular child has a raised ICP and uh, multiple episodes of vomiting, and if it is taken up without adequate NPO, I would uh, go for a rapid sequence induction in this particular case. Then I would have to uh, give a calculated dose. So I would lose, use thiopentone. For this child, I would use a, a dose of 80 milligram along with... Uh, 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 and after uh, with uh, I would not um, I would like to uh, do a gentle laryngoscopy after one minute and uh, secure the airway with a size five microcuff and a tracheal tube fixed at fourteen centimeters. Sir. Now. Uh, step back with your induction uh, style. Why did you say thiopentone sodium? Uh, thiopentone decreases the cerebral metabolic rate of O2 and decrease, uh, decreases cerebral... Propofol is not a cerebral protectant. Uh, of course it is, sir. This particular child uh, had a thiopentone or propofol either can be used, sir. A mm. propofol in fact, doses also can be used, but this in this particular case, uh, because I opted for rapid sequence induction and uh, usually for more rapid sequence induction, the standard thing is thiopentone that is modified can be given with proper followers. Then what? Now, don't uh, uh, talk about some ancient practices. If you have a proven advantage, then uh, you talk about uh, the practices, the ancient practices. Otherwise, no. Then why succinyl colon bus? Why succinyl colon? 
succinyl choline or uh, non depolarizing glycine can be used sir but usually uh, we use succinyl choline because it is a four year old child and uh, because it is a difficult airway you usually go for succinyl choline difficult airway difficult airway sir hmm why is it a difficult airway uh, because yeah even if it is an enlarged head uh, it, uh, if you prepare yourself well you talked about uh, the uh, roll under the shoulders and or a pillow right under the uh, torso then uh, the head becomes gets back into the neutral position should not be a difficult thing interestingly when we were uh, uh, students chani might uh, remember we uh, the most favorite position was you sit down at the head end and take the patient's uh, head out of the table onto your lap that used to be the most comfortable position for everyone to uh, intubate yeah uh, but uh, i am not okay with your uh, succinyl choline it's a little too dicey i don't know i don't like succinyl choline somehow yeah the are you okay channi with the succinyl choline for intubations i don't know that is plus as you on see. the ict basically it's not plus or minus right it's a plus and that too ict yeah you are saying head something. circumference as you are saying uh, we are not expecting much of difficult airway in this kid right yeah. so uh, the logic of using a snail colon you would be uh, with proper positioning you would be able to achieve that sniffing position you you would be able to mass ventilate well and then go ahead with the which relaxin would you want, want to use if not succinyl choline now he will say atracurian i think i will now because it's a pediatric patient i want to play it safe atracurian now deepak yes sir <laughs> i knew i knew modified rapid sequence you said and with that recurium uh, for modified rapid sequence instead of succinyl choline rocuronium can be used sir in dose of 1.2 mg per kg adequate intubating conditions should be attained within 1 minutes okay okay yeah fine not uh, cisetracurium so modified rsi hmm rocuronium is rocuron okay Sure. Even cetracurium, when you use 0.2 milligrams per kg, it will give you an intubating condition in about uh, uh, 60 and seconds. Should not be an issue. Yeah. Carry on. So, what are your interop intraoperative goals? Uh, intraoperative goals would include uh, to prevent any further rise in ICP. That has to be uh, done with maintaining normoxia. Uh, carbon dioxide being maintained in the low normal uh, limits, maintaining normothermia. This child is particularly prone for hypothermia because uh, one due to the pediatric age group, then also due to the uh, relatively larger size of head. Uh, then uh, uh, due to the, the positioning, the child is usually, uh, the neurosurgeon would position the child in a Deepak, the whole area, the whole area is exposed, right? From your head to the is exposed. Okay, go on. And uh, the neurosurgeon would be positioning the child in a uh, neck flex towards one side. There is a risk of uh, one, this particular uh, rotation itself can lead to venous congestion in the uh, venous congestion and thereby increase in ICP. Also, a chance of accidental extubation is there. Um, hey, then uh, the process. What, why are you so bothered about hypothermia? Uh, this particular child is uh, at a uh, high risk of hypothermia because of the factors. One, due to the increased amount of exposure. This hypothermia can, can lead to uh, metabolic acidosis, delayed awakening from surgery. This particular, uh, the surgeon would like to, would have to do a neuro evaluation immediately post procedure so delayed awakening uh, can be a problem to the surgeons why does he have to assess the neurological outcome so early it's after all a vpshunt 
and you are handling a drowsy child. Obviously, you don't expect miracles, right? Yeah, that's why I don't think it's an issue. Yeah, hypothermia is obviously not good for uh, uh, the patients. The way they lose uh, heat is uh, very rapid, right? Yeah, that's why yes. you are talking about uh, keeping even uh, antiseptic lotions uh, warm. Have you ever done that? Yes. Antiseptic lotions, spirit is heated. Yes. Hmm? No, sir. What do you heat? Yeah, at least uh, don't warm them up. You keep try to keep them at the uh, atmospheric room uh, temperature. Now, room, room temperature room temperature is going to be disastrous because your OT temperature is going to be 18 degrees. You cannot obviously uh, use it at 18 degrees. It has to be warmer than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Carry on. Hypothermia is not good. Yeah. Okay, Basically, huh? the oxygen requirement goes up and then... Uh, uh, Shivering is an increase of oxygen requirement for no, the child. No, it is a one-year-old child, as uh, Dr. Chani said, uh, shivering is not an issue there, right? The patient no, will not maintain uh, uh, the core body temperature because they massively lose. There is no protective mechanism in uh, uh, that child if it is one-year-old. If it's four-year-old, yes, maybe patient will shiver. But the oxygen requirement goes up, right? Therefore, you may not be able to supplement with the enough oxygen to maintain the oxygenation also. Yeah. Then. We were talking about ICP, right? So, uh, so how, what are the factors, the cerebral perfusion pressure? They, what is the formula for CPP? What does it depend on? How do we maintain uh, it depends upon the mean arterial pressure minus the ICP. Right. Uh, so, so, what are the uh, factors? What, what, sh what should we take care of during this meeting? You were uh, this is the regulation of uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is by uh, multiple mechanisms. The myogenic mechanism maintains the cerebral perfusion pressure within a normal autoregulatory range. There, where, there the mean arterial pressure is the main uh, determining factor. Uh, mean arterial pressure within a range of 60 to 140. Uh, in that range, the cerebral perfusion pressure is maintained due to the myogenic, uh, myogenic response of the, uh, of the vessels. Also, there is a chemical uh, regulation. In this chemical regulation, what plays a part are one, the cerebral metabolic rate, where, uh, wherein uh, if there is an increased cerebral metabolic rate, there is increased oxygen requirement and thereby there is increased blood flow towards the uh, cranial cavity, which is known as flow metabolism coupling, where there is, when there is increased, uh, then uh, the second and most important and uh, most controllable factor is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. In conditions where there is P increased PaCO2, there is increased blood flow into the cranial cavity and thereby there is an increase in the intracranial pressure. Uh, if the PaCO2 is maintained within the low normal limits, there is significant decrease in the ICP. So that is your normally, and so as a temporizing measure in cases with high ICP, a small degree of hyperventilation can be used to decrease ICP. Then oxygen levels have to be maintained uh, within 65 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, other factors are the rheological uh, methods where the hematocrit has to be maintained within 33 to 35. All right, you told us about so many things. Tell me practically, how do you do all this? Um, first is, ICP in this first, patient. In this patient, we have to prevent any acute rise in the MAP. Uh, that is done by adi uh, ensuring adequate depth at the time of in airway instrumentation. Uh, additional stress, stress, stress responses to intubation can be blunted by giving additional doses of propofol or uh, preservative for free lignocaine at adequate timings before uh, scopy. Then uh, once the airway is secured, a mild degree of hyperventilation can be done to maintain the PSEO2 at low normal limits. Uh, we can make sure that there is no uh, extent, excessive uh, flexion of the neck so that further increases in the cerebral blood volume due to venous compression does not occur. Um, 
uh, so you're going ahead with the surgery and the VP shunt has been put in C2. Which is the most common VP shunt which is used? Uh, here we use uh, shunt known as Ubadhyay shunt, which is a low pressure shunt, uh, valved low pressure shunt, which has been developed in AIMS, New Delhi. Uh, it is a low cost stylistic shunt. Uh, Chabra shunt, right? Chabra shunt is also used. Two types of shunt. Chabra and Ubadhyay are the two types of shunts. Okay. Okay. What kind of shunts are those? Those are low pressure shunts with a low threshold for drainage. Right, right. So, a uh, shunt is put in C2 and the case is completed. Now, when do you extubate the baby? Uh, extubation is done once the child is fully awake and uh, there is act, act, uh, the child is obeying commands. There is uh, enough time has passed since the last dose of relaxant. So enough time has passed since the last dose of relaxant is a very vague uh, description, right? What do you look for? Uh, regular spontaneous respirations with adequate tidal volume. What else? Uh, tone, sustained head lift. Sustained head lift. With uh, the baby, the huge head, you're expecting head lift to come after the surgery and after the case is done. A four-year-old child, you want the child to lift the head up, thrash around, maybe thrash around. No. Be reasonable when you say that. Adequate tone, adequate, tone, adequate tidal volume. Hmm. Yeah, obviously in a in a pediatric patient, you can't look at right. all the all the uh, uh, recovery signs of what you see in adults, right? Yeah. Same thing with uh, patient should be uh, as in there should be no hypothermia. Yeah. Patient should be warm. No, as uh, warm volume status has to be maintained. Correct. If there... Hmm. Correct. Carry on. No hypothermia, adequate volume status, adequate tone, uh, regular respiration with adequate tidal volume. And well analgized, hemodynamically uh, stable, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well analgesed. What what analgesics? Uh, during the induction time, I would like to give a short acting opioid fentanyl. I would like to give it uh, two microgram per kilogram. And further, uh, during uh, the painful procedure, painful parts of the procedure are initial uh, scalp incision, tunneling of the catheter, and the abdominal incisions. During these times, I would like to increase the depth, and if required, I would also like to supplement uh, fentanyl. At Five to ten micrograms at that point. Five to ten. How much will you supplement? Per mil, per kg. Uh, no, no, sir, total. Mm -hmm. Initially, I would, uh, I would manage the stress response to these procedures with increasing depth by giving proper fold. If that is not adequate, I would like to give short. Point five. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, sir, Get please. It. No, you have tubed the patient. Patient is receiving uh, oxygen, a mixture of oxygen and zeofluorine. Oxygen, air and zeofluorine. Okay, air also. Okay, oxygen, air and zeofluorine. And then you want to give propofol. Why can't you deepen the planes of anesthesia with the, an increased uh, dial concentration of zeofluorine? Uh, in this particular case, if uh, inhalational agents are kept at more than one mag, that itself can increase the cerebral blood volume due to cerebral vasodilatation. So, uh, I would like to keep the inhalationals at less than one mag. If the ETC O2 is normal? If there is normal capnia, normal carbia? Are you still worried about uh, CO fluorine increasing the cerebral blood supply and the uh, patient will have raised ICP? Uh, if it is at the lower yeah, limits. Okay. Anyways, one exhaled MAC is equivalent to an intubating dose of the relaxant. Therefore, it should be good enough. Yeah, anyways, you supplement with the fentanyl before the painful procedures, I accept. That should be good enough. One MAC, you can always manage. There should not be any issues with uh, the the uh, intracranial pressures. Okay. 
I didn't ask you to increase it to beyond one Mac. One Mac should be okay. Yeah. He has left, I think. Huh? Left the session, I guess. He'll rejoin, sir. Wow. Okay. Yeah, can we have those questions now before uh, Deepak comes back in? Yes. Momita? Yes, I yes, sir. Yes, I don't sir. see any so, questions. Um, sir, I haven't put any questions yet, sir, as I'm sharing the screen. So let me uh, stop the screen share. Now I'm checking. Just allow me a moment. <coughs> I, I could not see any questions, Mamita. Uma, could you uh, see any? Ma'am, a question, sir, coming in a different... Ma'am, I cannot order. see any questions as such. Well. Please okay. allow me a moment, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Coming... Sure, sure. Yes, questions <clears throat> are coming in uh, another portal. So I'm okay. listed all the questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Uma, yeah. Is uh, yes, sir. Ah, no, no. I just wondered whether uh, Deepak has uh, gone for his dinner, leaving us here. No, okay. he has come back. He has come back. He went for so the question. Time. She is just uh, putting it in the chat box, sir. No, yeah, that we will take up later. Now, Deepak has okay. come back. We will continue with the ragging of Deepak. So the case I... is not yet over. Okay. Okay. We'll. Oh, it's already nine o'clock. Yes, sir. Uh oh. Okay, Chani. Yes, you sir. don't. Uh, you don't complete. I think we can me. take up the questions as you please, sir. <laughs> or you want to? No, I. I. I'm okay with the, any of this. Yeah. As you please, sir. Whatever you say. There are a few questions which uh, Maumita has put in the chat box. Which we can take up one by one, sir. Okay. Does fentanyl prolong the duration of subarachnoid block or only improve the quality of uh, it? Uh, it also prolongs the duration of uh, uh, analgesia. We are talking about the analgesia, therefore it increases the duration of, uh, prolongs the duration of analgesia. Yep. Lithotomy can straighten the lumbar lordosis and can increase the ascent of spinal drug. Yes, agreed. In, and we are, were also actually talking about uh, uh, trend Lumberg position. Therefore, we were doubly worried about uh, the drug ascending up. In patients with severe cardiac dysfunction, graded epidural can also be given. Yes, there is no doubt about that. There were no questions as such. There were statements. Okay. Uh, sir, yes, uh, these are the questions that I have received, sir. Yeah, that's all. All right. I think... Uh, uh, Achilles saved. Otherwise, he would have had to answer more questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Chani, will you uh, ask him the next? Yeah, Deepak, so you, you decide. I, I forgot where were we actually. Uh, so he, uh, you we have. We were extubating. We were extubating. Yeah. Achha, post operative analysis. Yeah. Before we go ahead, post operative. Uh, for this postoperatively, uh, one I could give uh, infiltration at the sites of inc uh, incision. Also, postoperatively, paracetamol, IV paracetamol at a dose of 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram, provided the IV line is still there. And also, uh, if further analgesic requirements are there, what? I would. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by provided the IV line is still there? You're planning to pull it out when the patient wakes up, is it? Just like no, so on, this side you, yeah. on this side you remove the endotracheal tube, on this side you remove the IV cannula. You are too much, man. Huh? It's there now. IV line is there. Postoperatively <laughs> after the next, for the second and third day postoperatively, oh, I would no. have to give. Don't go that far. We will only focus on the time when the baby is still with us in the postoperative recovery zone. Okay. Once the patient leaves the PACU, generally we don't take care of the analgesia, right? It depends on the surgeon to manage. Therefore, we'll only focus on the PACU. Okay, when the patient is in the post anesthesia care unit, we'll stick to that. Yeah, obviously the child will have a cannula. Yep. Yeah, paracetamol. Uh, yeah. Paracetamol, IV paracetamol mm -hmm. at a dose of 15 to 20 milligrams. Is it enough? Is it enough? 
paracetamol? So post-operatively pain for this procedure uh, will not be very high, sir, provided I'm always also giving uh, site infiltrations. No, the what infiltrations? The suture site I'm giving local ah, anesthetic. That, uh, I don't know how many surgeons are very comfortable with that. Most of our surgeons are not keen. They, they think it uh, interferes with the wound healing. They have their own concepts, which are wrong, but still it's very difficult to push some sense into their brains. Yeah, that's a good option then. Anyway, neurosurgery, before they start only, they uh, preemptively, they infiltrate with the... Uh, uh, and adrenaline. Basically, they need the adrenaline component. Therefore, uh, that will give preemptive analgesia. For a long time, the patient will not have uh, pain. Yes, paracetamol. And parental bonding, basically the parent is the best uh, analgesic. Take the patient back to the parent as early as you can. Then what else? Paracetamol. Then? Anything else you want to give? Yeah. Try to avoid uh, sedative. Uh, uh, like to avoid in try situation. to avoid. And uh, then you are left with uh, not much of a choice. Diclofenac is something which... Uh, most of them don't like because uh, uh, of the inherent problems. They're, one of them is the bleeding. It's, a, it's quite difficult. Rely on paracetamol and parental uh, support. Yeah, should be good enough. One, uh, uh, what kind of shunt do you use? So two types of shunts commonly used. One is uh, Chapra shunt, the, the next one is Ubadhyay shunt. Yeah. That's what I want. Uh, both are low, yeah. low pressure. Both are? Uh, low pressure shunts. Okay. Uh, is there any difference between a pediatric shunt and an adult shunt? Length. Uh, yeah, exactly. Length. Is, yeah. What can in you? the pediatric shunt, further increased uh, length has to be kept within the peritoneal cavity to accommodate for the length of the uh, for the growth of the child. Good. Otherwise, multiple shunt revision surgeries would be required, required. as the child grows. Yeah, All right. Good. That's nice. Fluid management? Uh, Intraop, the first type would have to uh, correct the dehydration preoperatively itself. Uh, for this child, uh, uh, intraoperatively, I would like to give maintenance fluid based upon the holiday cigar formulas. Okay, done. But what fluid? Which fluid? Uh, a balance all solutions. Sir. Any other options? Any other options? You don't have ringer lactate. You don't have uh, the cabilite or uh, plasma light. Uh, you don't have. Can you make your own fluid? Yes. That was a favorite question of our examiners 30 years ago, 32 years ago. Okay. How will you make your own fluid? Can you tell me? What are the requisites inside when you make the fluid? Uh, should be ISO. are needed. Electrolytes are needed. Then ISO smaller should be ISO smaller. Yeah, try to be. Then what does the child need? Glucose. Glucose. Can be. Okay. Glucose. Not can be. The child needs glucose. You have to glucose uh, add glucose at any cost. Okay. Yeah. How do you take the consent for this child? Preoperatively, I would explain to the mother the risks of the procedure, uh, both the surgical risks and the anesthetic mm -hmm. risks. I would explain to her that uh, the case would be done under general anesthesia and this would involve uh, it's a mother. It's, it's a mother. mother. Okay. Good. Yes. Anything else, uh, Chani? Can we wind up? It's 9.10. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Un unless Jayshri Madam calls us for dinner. Are we invited, ma'am? Just remember, she has left for dinner. Anyways, it was um, uh, Dr. Uma. Uh, yes, sir, I'm there. Anything else? Anything else? Uh, no, sir, it has been a great uh, webinar with a lot of question and answers. Yeah. 
and very informative uh, two uh, very good topics and uh, really uh, enlightening for all the pgs especially the exam going batch and uh, i wish uh, we could have had a greater discussion but yes time is a limiting factor sir but it was excellent i'll just call up madam uh, she'll just join yes, for the uh, woman here yeah, woman here yeah. okay ma'am okay ma'am no <laughs> right ma'am thank you so yeah thank you Yeah, so as you said, it was an excellent webinar, and it's my honor to thank Dr. Madhusudan and Dr. Chandni for moderating it so well. The students were truly grilled, and I'm sure Akhil and Deepak will start preparing more. You were very good, of course, but you've just learned that how much more the examiner asks, and simple questions, questions that are. that you do in the ot every day they were asking those so it's very very important and we had such a lively discussion thanks a lot uh, dr madhusudan and dr chandni thank you very much and thank you very much <laughs> really i mean these are such practical uh, these cases come so often tur definitely has to be there and of course a pediatric case so students i think you have received our e certificate from the ica complimenting you for the participation am i right akhil and deepak yes ma'am yes sir yes yes, yes. so congratulations study hard thank you very much and a good night uh, dr upadhyay and dr chandni akhil deepak thank you very much momita before you shut us yeah. off yeah uh, yes sir uh, thank you ma'am uh, thank you jayshri ma'am uh, it's always a pleasure seeing you and at thank least you. on the webinars here it, yes. it's very pleasant it's very pleasant thank you see you and then uh, yes, uh, chandni it's uh, great to have uh, the uh, what participated in the webinar with you and uh, <laughs> yes. try to try to no chandni uh, uh, i mean obviously he, she was my student here but yeah. she has also grown And it I, was know. Excellent, excellent I know. Question. I know. Excellent question. I know. We feel question. so proud when we see yes. our students <laughs> yeah, growing up. Yeah, it was very and... nice. It yes. was really nice to be a mm. part of this with uh, Chani. And then yes. uh, Akhil and Deepak. Uh, no, I I think uh, the thing was uh, TRP was a well focused uh, topic because we didn't mm. deviate much. But the pediatrics, uh, yes, uh, hydrocephalus and the mm. pediatrics. there was a lot to deviate therefore maybe you felt a little disheartened somewhere but don't worry anyways your exams are quite far off and you are well prepared akil got a distinction from my side deepak actually initially you did very well but only towards the end the clinical management i think your institutional practice is a little but uh, uh, gone are the days when uh, examiners ask you uh, what do you do in your institution generally what we want to know is what is to be done in an ideal situation the textbook uh, description will uh, go forward with that okay what is to be done in what do you do in your institution is a little dicey therefore uh, we'll stick to what the books say okay thank you so much it has been great thank again ma'am thank you so much good night thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, My thanks, Uma. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. So, with the, all your permission, now I'm closing the session here for yeah, today. Yeah, I'm sure. looking forward to. Thanks, thanks, Momita. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And good night to all of you. Good, good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.